team report. What's happening, Heather? Doing nothing. You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's boring. Three life, yes, sir. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the enforcement. And at the end of the day, each and every man can go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan the Liberty for All. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and we are back after being gone a couple weeks. Uh, we were going to come back yesterday, which I kind of wish we did to do the Trump show, but we're going to do that tomorrow because we will be talking about some things that have to do with Trump today, but we're going to focus more on the uh, economic uh results of the president-elect and and the uh, geopolitical, uh, how that's going to affect uh, that as well. So anyway, thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Uh, we're coming to you live from Las Vegas, and I, of course, am your host, Dave Vaughn. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All Media and Radio Network, which now runs 24-7. So even though we weren't on live, uh, there were still shows playing. So you can always listen to something. And we have, uh, I forget what show we're on now. I think we're at like 350 something. So we're getting up there uh as far as the amount of shows that we have. So but you can listen live on speaker.com and nonpartisanlibertyforall.com to the live stream that plays the live show of course as well as the other shows or other material uh that we play through there and to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote self-ownership and the, uh, the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning be able to do whatever you, you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom. Exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent, by threat of force and violence. Damn, my stomach is like killing me while I'm doing this. So I apologize for any <laughs> mistakes I'm making there. But um, we are happy to hear from you via phone. Uh, the number is 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or via Skype at Nonpartisan Liberty for All is our username. And you can check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com, which links to all our social media pages and has all that information as well. All of our contact information. It has articles, uh, blogs, all of that stuff. And speaking of calling in, I got about. Jesus, like 14 uh, texts on my phone, the show number from people that were asking to vote for mainly Hillary um, last Tuesday. Was it last Tuesday or last 
what was the date of the election? Was it the eighth? Yeah. And a bunch of calls too. And what's funny is, I mean, I guess people have the number because of the show, but they actually, it's under my fiance's name because it's on her plan. And they actually mentioned her name. Like they said, hi, Katie or, or whatnot. So how they got the number, um, I have no idea because she never put that number on any of her uh, register. When she registered to vote, she didn't put that number on there because she didn't have it. So they must be uh, looking up a lot of information or using different ways of getting information um, to get that fucking number. So that's pretty fucked up. But anyway... We are here today with Ken Shorjan of The Daily Economist, also of uh, the Ken Shorjan channel on YouTube, so you can listen to him there. And, uh, of course, uh, The Daily Economist is at Daily Economist, thedailyeconomist.com. Um, so we haven't had Ken on for a while since we've been away. So, of course, as always, it's great to have Ken on. Yo, yo, yo. Good to be here, Dave. So, and I'm going to try to, uh, hopefully my stomach will start to feel better. Uh, it's like, a, it's like one of them pains that are just like, it's a half pain, half like sick to your stomach. Uh, fuck. So hopefully, uh, I'll get through the show. Okay. Um, if I have to go throw up or something, we might have to take a little break. Not that I want to disgust anybody. But um, anyway, I'm like rubbing my stomach, if you can hear that in the background. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad you didn't have any peppermint oil. What does that yeah. do? Uh, actual therapeutic peppermint oil, that's the uh, best stuff in the world for uh, stomach pains and stomach aches and gas and all that. Wow. Well, I, yeah. got, I got some stuff. I'm, I'm, I have uh, this Ratadine stuff, and I have some other stuff for pain, so I'm, I should be good. Hopefully, um, I think I have a fucking ulcer, to be honest, all the stress. Anyway, um, before uh, we get to a lot of the Trump stuff and and I'm going to be talking tomorrow more about just the election itself and the protests and all of that. But as I mentioned today, we'll be talking more about how it it. it affects the economy and how it has affected the economy already. And we'll be talking about some of his uh, picks so far or potential picks when it comes to his cabinet and advisors and how that may or may not affect uh, the economy or uh, relationships with other countries as well. But before we get to that, I guess with, uh, I know the dollar's doing well, and we'll talk about that, but I guess the rest of the world is not. And India, uh, from what I understand uh, from one of Ken's stories, is l thinking about banning uh, the import, imp uh, banning importing gold and eliminating cash. So we've talked um, before about cashless societies and, um, you know, them being the powers that be, you know, ultimately moving to a cashless world, really. But um, India looks like it might be going there sooner than uh, we uh, had thought. Yeah, the thing about India, okay, we're not talking like Zimbabwe, even Argentina or Venezuela. We're talking about what, one of the major emergency, uh, emerging markets. Yeah, what would you call India as far as in, – and I had an ex-girlfriend who had been there a bunch of times because they had outsourced to India, and she had gone there to train the people that they were outsourcing to. I mean, I don't know. I, I wouldn't – call it at the same level of the United States because you have people like living in the street and shit like that. But I wouldn't call it a third world country neither. Like, how would you define it? Like somewhere in between? 
No, in, India is, is a cosmology of many different, okay? You, uh, you got to remember going back historically, India um, was the ultimate in segregation, they had the caste system. Yeah, I was just going to say that. They still, um, a lot of them still believe in it today. Hin- the Hinduism uh, and um, all of well, that, not, that they believe. Well, go right, ahead. But, but the caste system goes farther back than Hinduism. No, but I mean, with even today, that they believe like if they do good in this life, they'll achieve a higher level of success in the next life or something. And. Well, sure, that's yeah. a religious aspect, but no, right. the caste system is much, much different. The caste system is actually racial. Um, you know, you remember what the what the the Nazis wanted to create, right? The Aryan race, right, right. Well, the Aryans actually go back thousands of years to the Indus Indus Valley, and the Aryans were from the northern steppes of uh, of Eurasia, where Mongolia might be today, or um, the steppes of Russia. And of course, they were lighter skin. And they I didn't realize there was actually. Uh, sorry to cut you off, but I didn't realize there was actually an Aryan race uh, historically. I just thought they were creating. That's what they called it. That that, that was um, what they were creating. Um, but so you're saying that historically, there was, there was a tri- tribe known as the Aryans. Okay, yeah, and you know they they weren't a civilization. They were just a tribe, nomadic tribe right. from there, the Aryans, just like you might have had during the time of Rome. You had the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals and, and that. Okay, the Aryans came down. They entered into the Indus Valley, and India wasn't a country then. It was just a and territory. Were, were they like blonde, white? Uh, they were much lighter skinned. And, of course, if you take a look at what uh, the um, Baltic uh, and the Eurasian – they were probably a mixture of – I don't want to say what what are known as Assyrians, but they certainly weren't the blonde, blue-eyed. That, that they were totally like blonde. tan, uh, like, like Indians. Well, basically, you have no, they, Indians now that are very the, the, light-skinned. Think, of, think and, of Czechoslovakia. Think of the Czechs. Think of the Russians. Think of – Well, they're Ukrainians. white. Well, yeah. They, they just don't I mean, have blonde hair. White. But think of them a little bit more – you know, a little bit darker, but not much. Think, you know, the Mongols, the Mongols in that uh, who were under Genghis Khan, they weren't Chinese, you know, yellow skinned. They were more with the features, but they were more whiter, you know, lighter, light, much lighter skinned. But think of that, you know, because we're talking 5,000 years ago when this right. happened. So anyway, um, the Aryan uh, nomadic tribes came down into the Indus Valley. They took over what is now India and they created the caste system. And the caste system was based on the lighter skin you had, the higher in the caste you were. Yeah, that I didn't it's- know. I, I, I knew about the caste system as far as, you know, it's it's a system of who's on top, essentially. And, you know, these people are at the top. And then, you know, you kind of go through levels. I knew that, but I didn't know it was based on the lighter skins were at the top and whatever. So that's how it, because it went on for a long time, right? So it got to a point where was it still based on skin, or it was just uh, no, it's based on skin, and they still like always, or it just carried over to these, you know, the bloodlines happen to still be light skin. Well, the, or the blood, the bloodlines, you know, have a lot to do with it. Um, the the rajas and that they they were more darker skin and they were had the power but for the for the lesser people you know take the nobility out of it and the royalty and nobility is is above all the caste right. system really was affected for all the way down down the line now when you were asking about is india sort of third world country india is the seventh largest economy in the world the only economies that are well, no, I didn't up. say I would call it a third world country. I, I said I don't know if I call. I'd say where would you put it? Because I wouldn't call it a third world country. But on the no, other side of it, I don't know that I'd call it as sophisticated as the United States. No, but see, this is this is where this is where I said there's a lot of cosmology, because uh, or cosmology is not the cosmopolitan is a better word because. The reason is 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 India is made up of a ton of segments. You know, if you remember going back to Gandhi, 
uh, when Gandhi was around, Britain controlled all of India. Right. Well, India, India, when it was well, that was uh, his break- purpose of going there was to get Britain out. Yeah, right. Yeah, but but that was just the first step. The next step was is you had two religions in what is you know India. You had Islam and you had Hinduism, and be in the, I think it was 1934 when it finally broke away. They ended up having to split India into two countries, Pakistan, which That's is where the say, Islamists yeah. went, and of course India. And they've been fighting over the uh, the Kashmir, uh, a fertile a fertile valley between the two countries for forever. But that aside, you have when, when you talk about what where does you know uh, India rate? You have a very thriving uh, rich, uh, rich society. You have a semi you know middle class. And then you have a lot of poor, and the reason that the but you have the poor are like destitute, it, it, just because, like I said, I, and and it's a huge country, so I, I, you know people could see parts of the ghetto in the United States, and I guess say the same thing that I'm saying because I'm basing it off of people that have been there, but have been to just certain areas. You know what I mean? Right. And so you could probably see if somebody takes you to a specific neighborhood in the U.S. And that's all you see. You could, hey, that country's fucked up. But I mean, it, it, from what they describe, there's uh, people that are living like literally in the streets and very, very, uh, you know, bad conditions. Like Million, millions live in the streets of Calcutta just and Delhi. Straight up poverty. You have, you have villages that haven't seen electricity or running water. Still. Yeah, so you have that side of it. But then you have these like great hotels and whatever like five star you know and you have india getting involved obviously everybody's outsourcing to fucking india unfortunately um but as well but what what i was getting around to okay is the fact that india for thousands of years believes in one certain form of money you know what that money is it's gold right gold they wear they wear their wealth around their necks. As a matter of fact, I started America- thinking about that because uh, sorry to interrupt again, but uh, uh, when you were um, talking about uh, this on your show um, on uh, YouTube, again, uh, Ken Shorjan, just go to YouTube, put in Ken Shorjan or the Daily Economist, and you'll find the the show. But um, that that might be something a good idea. Now you could get robbed you know, for like a chain or something, but, you know, keep that shit tucked and carry like a big, huge fucking medallion under your shirt. And you always have your gold with you. And, you know, like, let, let, I, let I don't say, know. It's, let it's, me say this. Okay. It seems like there, a good there idea. Is, <laughs> there is a respect in India for, for ownership of gold. Okay. Let me tell you something. They wear their gold out there, and you know, in the alleys. They, they're not really. Well, I'm talking of about robbed. the U.S. If you're wearing, you know, gold, you got to be careful where you go. But look, look, look in the U.S., they will kill you for fifty cents. You get some druggie strung out, and he wants to to rob a convenience store, and he wants your wallet. And if you got fifty cents, he'll kill you. It doesn't matter. No, it depends you where know. you go. But what, what I'm saying yeah. is, uh, it, that's not necessarily a bad idea to store your gold somehow that way, but, you know, of course, tuck it in so nobody can see it. But uh, then you always have your gold with you, and if you have to uh, disappear, you know, you got a bunch of gold, <laughs> and you don't yeah. have to go get it out of a vault somewhere. Well, exactly. And in, and in India, they they really put, you know, they love their necklaces because what they did, would do is when they would have some wealth, um, they would get the big links because if they wanted to buy something, they would just tear off a link and use that to purchase, make their purchases. Now, the reason this is significant is because the gold uh, as wealth is as strong today as it's been for 5,000 years. And here's the kicker, okay? 25% or more of the people in India do not have a bank account. But they have gold? They re- they, well, that or What's, they rely upon using the currency for black market transactions. What's the percentage, uh, or do you know the percentage that has uh, gold in India? Percentage of people. Uh, the percentage of people is is that on average every family has about nineteen ounces of gold. 
trying to think. Think about that. Yeah, that's a lot because it, you're talking about twelve hundred dollars an ounce. They went, every time there's a wedding, gold is given as a thing. Every uh, every sacred holiday, gold is given. I mean, gold is given as the gift for everything. Everybody accumulates it. Everybody gives it. That's that's the thing. So 25% of the people don't have bank accounts. That means they don't have direct deposit. That means they get paid cash or they or whatever, or they don't have a jobs and they just use you know barter, you know the currency for barter. Well, this started off uh, almost immediately after the election here in the United States. Modi, who's the uh, the president of uh, or prime minister of uh, India, he decides that he wants to implement some capital controls. The reason they have to do the capital controls is because they are hemorrhaging cash. They are de Their currency is devaluing. They desperately need to do something to uh, ensure that they control what's, their monetary system. What's the name of the currency that they use in India? Uh, the rupee. Oh, right, right. I yeah. did know that. So, they, so Modi didn't even give the people uh, a breathing space. He simply eliminated... The top two denominations of currency said they're no longer valid. Not even a waiting period where you can go change it in. He just said they're no longer valid. Wait, so what do you mean? Like that would be like eliminating hundreds and fifties? Uh, yeah, but 100, 150. Well, I'm saying in, in, if we're talking about the U.S., so, you, so you're talking yeah, about. That would, be like saying, that would be like the government saying right now, everyone's $100 bills and $50 bills are worth, worth anything. Yeah. Period. Okay. Now. In in uh, India, the two highest denominated bills, in dollar terms, are only worth about ten or twenty bucks. Yeah, That's but if you got a whole if you got a whole bunch of them, well, sure. But uh, the the key thing is 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 he did this to try to force everybody to go to the banks and turn them in and get the new currency right. because these ones were being used for black market. They were out of control. Now the government wants to. Uh, you know, make sure that they have new bills control. So, well, speaking the problem of, is, is you have 25% of the people who are illiterate, don't have a bank account, and their money is suddenly becoming worthless. But speaking of gold, um, that they're, you know, everybody has gold. Is their money backed by gold or backed no. by anything? No, the government hardly has any gold at all. I don't think there's any country, right, that their money is backed by anything anymore, No, we have right? we, no. We have not had a gold standard since 71, and then included... Well, I know, that was... Yeah, right, the U.S., but I, I was... No, nope. since we're the reserve but currency... But it was, right, right, every country in the world, right. Fiat. Yeah, everybody's instantly became fiat. Um, now, the thing about it is, is... But a, a country could have... Uh, sorry, but even though they were a reserve currency, could, a country, if they wanted to... They could have went out on their own, right, and backed their currency by gold if the, if they wanted to implement that, like China's kind of trying to do now. Well, yeah, but China back in the 1970s, right? They was they not couldn't do strong. Well, right. No, no country was, was strong enough to do it uh, right. back then. I, I realize right. that. What do you think the United States military would have done? The you know the the neoconservatives, if you dared challenge the the unipolar reserve currency. You know, you'd be like Iraq and Afghanistan right now. Right. So, um, plus the fact that instantly once that was done, their own economies were in the pothole. Uh, oh, by the way, in the West, guess where everybody's gold was? It was in the U.S. It was in Fort, Fort Knox, Fort Knox and yeah. it became the Federal Reserve. So they couldn't yeah, get yeah. access to their gold anyway. Yeah, I know, because Fr we've talked about this before. Like, France demanded their gold. And they Germany wouldn't give did. it to them. Germany did. Oh, I thought it was France. Six, no, Germany did, but Germany had their gold split between French banks and the Federal Reserve. And okay. the Federal Reserve wouldn't get back, and they slowly matriculated some from France. Um, but the, the key thing here with India is is that, of course, people, unlike here in the U.S., who don't have an understanding of money, money is is life there. You know, if you if you wear your wealth around your neck, you understand money. You know its value, and you know what it is. And when the government starts messing with money, needless to say, I just sent you. You can take a look on Skype uh, to follow through on this. This is a picture of the bank runs that are occurring today in India, where everybody is just scrambling to get their money out of banks. He just he just kicked off a massive bank run as soon as they opened, and the price of gold in Indian rupees 
has skyrocketed, is past all-time highs. It is going to the moon. This is why people, when they see the gold price go down in dollars, need to stop thinking unipolar. Right now, because other currencies are devaluing and they're and they're going, you know, virtually on the point of collapse, the price of gold and the euro, the pound, the uh, rupee, all those are at at all time highs. It's only the dollar where we manipulate through the paper derivative market. So, gold is is shooting through the roof. I already told the story about in Venezuela that uh, if you had um, an ounce of silver, you get three to four months worth of food. And if you had an a gold coin, an ounce of gold, you could buy a house. So this is this is what happens when currencies lose confidence and you start getting to hyperinflation. There's a story in Weimar, Germany, just before the rise of Hitler. This is a cool story. Back before, um, before the, the hyperinflation, there was a bellhop at a, at a hotel. And uh, there was a rich couple that uh, he carried the luggage for and he did a few things for. And they gave him a tip of a gold coin, an ounce of gold. Then the hyperinflation came and that bellhop took that single ounce of gold and bought that, that hotel when it was about to go bankrupt. Wow. So uh, hyperinflation is not a monetary um, event. It's a lack of loss of confidence in the currency event. And right now we are seeing all across the world the uh, loss of confidence in currencies by the score, by the boatload. This is why the central banks have had to do negative interest rates. This is why they've been talking about banning cash. And that's exactly what Modi's doing because he needs to control money. Uh, if you don't control your own money, then pretty much you don't control, you know, your government is, is – without power so so he's trying to ban cash or at least cut it down to the smallest denominations to try to force people to put all their money in banks so that he can move to a digital system but then like i said you have 25 percent of the population who are both illiterate and don't have bank accounts it's not going to work and then you have all the people that have the gold all this gold and you know, and they're buying that around. They're taking so. all their money, and instead of putting it in banks, they're buying gold, thinking so that the currency's toast. That's the reason why he wants to stop the importing of gold, because right, because mo he can stop people then from buying more gold. Exactly, and force the people to have no choice. Right. This is this is also why, in places like Zimbabwe, when they had the hyperinflation, you know, the the hundred trillion dollar notes. Their stock market was the highest in the in the Afri on the continent of Africa. Why? Because if people couldn't buy eggs or milk, what are they going to do with that worthless paper money? Well, buy stocks. <laughs> so that's why they did. They just you put their money in the stock market. Paper? Yeah. Now they're not the only one. Um, like I said, this this has occurred ever since the election. What happened on the election was was so. But j just take a step back. So um, the world's uh, basically the only currency right now that is doing well is the U.S. dollar, right? Right, and that's a misnomer, and we'll get to that. And that's what you were going to get to, yeah. Yeah. What ended up happening was the dollar has been sitting around between 92 and 96 for the past three months. On the night of the election... What, what does that exactly mean, that you're saying that it's it's 96 okay. cents on the dollar? No, 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 no. There like, is an mean? index. It's called the U.S. dollar index. It's a basket of currencies in relationship to the dollar, but it, it's it's the way to relate the dollar in regards to other currencies. Okay. Okay. Um, because it's a reserve currency, it's made up, the, the, the weight in the index is made up of a lot of the major currencies, sort of like the SDR is for the IMF. Now, um, the the currency fell. You know, actually, it was so funny because I didn't even have to watch the the mainstream media to know what was going on on the election. I watched the Dow futures. I watched the price of gold. And I watched the dollar on the Forex. And I knew exactly who was winning at any given time because whenever hillary moved ahead the dollar rose dow futures uh, uh went down i mean or went positive and then the gold went down when uh trump moved ahead in florida and then started moving the rest of the night 
Gold went up $61 at one point. Dow futures were down 840 points, and the dollar uh, started tanking. Now, yeah, I remember when the, the the Dow was down, like at one point, um, the, when during because uh, I started watching it, but it was down like 700 points at one point when he was leading. So, yeah, exactly. Now, now the question comes: Why did why did um, everything suddenly turn positive the very next day? But these are these are all based before we get to this, like these are all based on perception and assumptions. Right. So what are based on perceptions? I'm sorry. What what are based on perceptions? And well, assumptions? the fact that, you know, the movement of this stuff are based on the perception of Trump and, and Clinton and what they right. were going to do or what people think they're going to do or what they, you know what I mean? So it, it doesn't really, it doesn't mean that these thoughts of or perceptions or uh, what people assume or expect that's going to happen is going to happen as far as what they're going to do, but it's based upon that. Yes, but you've got it partially right and partially wrong. It's not the perception of persons. No, no. but It's, it's the it's, perception of high-frequency trading computers. Right, right. No, that's, that's what I, that's what what I mean. That, that's what I mean. Because we, we had talked about before, and you had explained to me that, you know, uh, we were talking about something and some something that happened in the news – and then the stock went up or went down or whatever. I don't remember exactly what we were talking about. But, yeah, that the perception of it's all computerized and that based on, you know, the perception of that and the algorithms and however it's set up, that based upon all of that stuff and the perception of its perception, I guess, it doesn't really have a perception, but for all intensive purposes, I guess we can call it that, but it, it's whatever it thinks of, and it doesn't think neither, but you know what I mean. Right. The, these are computer algorithm, algorithms with particular sets that if they see particular news items, right, exactly. they instantly do billions of transactions at, at one flood. This is what a flash crash would be. Now, um, this is this is uh, what how the uh, Federal Reserve and the Treasury through the Exchange Stabilization Fund used to manipulate markets. They don't have to t take a whole boatload of money, even though they have it, to go ahead and change something in the markets. They don't have to go out and buy like a bunch of stocks to try to. No, what they do is they when they created ETFs and uh, like the Spider, which is the S and P, uh, the VIX. The uh, you know different things like that. When they buy the indices, it affects every single stock in that index. It, it okay. because of the same reason, right? Because we we talked about that before, and um, you know I'm basing it off of what you told me because you right. know you know all about, about this shit, and I'm you know a lot of it I've actually learned just by you know my conversations with you. But yeah, that it they don't have to they do what they don't have to go through with everything it perceives they that do, they're they gonna start. do right it perceives that they're gonna do something more or whatever or that it perceives with that the if they're gonna do computers right see the spider being being bought or they see the yen being bought or they see the vix being bought all of a sudden they all kick in and say that's a trend these these artificial intelligences that's a trend right, right we're getting in on it boom and then that's how they bring it you know they return that's how you go from 840 points down on the dow futures to ending the next business day plus 230 and that's how people can that know how the system works can manipulate the market right well yeah, yeah bullion banks Think I, of it, I mean, people billion with like banks. billion billionaires and stuff like that. I'm sure you have to put a lot of money into certain things. Not right, but but the, most of the most of the moves we see in the markets today are are two things. They're high frequency trading computers make up 76 percent of all trades. That means computers are doing three quarters of every trade you see on the Dow, S and P, and Nasdaq. 
Okay, the billionaires we talk about in the hedge funds, yeah, they're buying they're buying stuff, but the, even the mutual funds we're talking about a limited amount of volume that they actually put into there. So it's the the days of getting the individual investor get those out of your mind. The only ones that that really are significance are when the corporations are buying back their own stock, which they've been doing now for two years. Right, because the whole Fed putting the money right. out there and that eventually affects individual yeah. stocks. While the high frequency trading computers and the the exchange stabilization fund or the plunge protection team from the, that's see, run from the treasury, they just buy the index and then they they just bombard the index with billions of of trades and that causes the entire index and every stock involved in that to move. Shouldn't in theory, if these are. Um, you know, some type of, uh, you know, computer intelligence or artificial intelligence, when it sees its own company buying back its stock, why would that be a positive thing to make it go up? You would think that if a company's buying back its stock, I mean, maybe it looks at it because the company no. has a lot of money. The, so the they only can... reason that the, the, the computers the... would deal with an individual company like you were mentioning is if there were news out on it. For example, the Federal Reserve comes out and they give their FOMC meeting minutes. There's a number of different keywords. Once that thing gets popped into the uh, Internet, you know, they, they, they do the FOMC meeting minutes. Right, we talked about There's this a number too. of keywords, these computers – and these computers are think think of, you know, Watson on steroids, and they sit connected directly to the uh, NYSE uh, stock exchange, so they can, you know, it, it's it's interesting because every when you make a trade with a broker, okay, these high fre frequency trading computers can see your trade in nanoseconds before it gets executed. And what they'll do is they'll see, okay, we're seeing some volume on this stock purchase. We will go ahead and do a million bumps. We'll bump the price up two or three cents. Now now in a market order versus a limit order, you have to buy it now two or three cents higher than when you actually clicked enter on your keyboard. And because they've done it a million times, these high frequency trader trading computers scarf up the the pennies of the difference of the thing okay that's what they're more than anything it's it's like th there was the old uh uh incidents of criminal activity when a banker um each night when the when the system was processing they were like scamming off all the half cents well that that's what they did in the movie um fuck what's that movie uh that um mike judge did Office space. Yeah. That's what they did in office space, yeah, exactly. except they fucked it up and they took too much money. <laughs> Instead and, of taking and, a half a cent, they ended up taking like, you know, uh, they had like $300,000 or a million dollars or something. Yeah. And, well, now think of uh, high frequency trading computers. And there's one for all the major bullion banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citibank. All those have their own, and they're all bombarding it with billions of transactions and trades every second. They're doing it at nanoseconds. Um, so they're getting ahead of every single trade that you, I, you, me, and, and any of us with a uh, Scott Trade broker account, when we click enter for an execution, that's why the executions don't happen instantaneously because the market makers got to wait until the high frequency trading computers are done with their stuff before they can determine a price and then, you know, give you the trade. That's why playing in the stock market now, uh, you, you, it's, there's no such thing as long-term. You'd be better off. I, I honestly think this now I'm not a stock expert. Like I said, a lot of the, I took class, I have an MBA, so I took some classes and learned a little and then, I never did anything with it, so I forgot most of that shit. And then a lot of it I know just from my conversations with you. But I know what stocks are, and I know about IPOs and all that stuff. And I would still say that you'd be better off studying uh, the numbers and analyzing. And, and if, if you're a programmer, coming up with your own program and betting college football than playing the stock market. Unless... 
you have insider information and you can follow the you know the scam basically because to me it's a scam and you're just following the scam if you can follow the scam you can make money there are no such thing as markets anymore there's only uh manipulations and right so so i mean like if if you can follow the manipulation like if you can follow those manipulations if you know about them or you're able to follow them just by you know knowing the stock market that well or whatever that you can make money that way but it's like like i said it seems like you're just uh making money off the scams that they're running i know it's not a scam per se but it's it might as well be you know i i after 2008 and the stock market crash i didn't buy a single stock up until about three months ago and i finally broke in and i bought one stock and and i've slowly been accumulating on it and the reason i did it is i didn't even bother to look at the fundamentals i didn't look at the technicals it's absolutely worthless i looked and saw who else was buying that stock okay it's right, a mining right. stock that's what i mean you're following the you know the people that rig the system or whatever or no not rig the, the system. system no not rig not rig the system i'm talking the the Eric Sprott, who's a billionaire who runs the, one of the, you know, who's the largest silver, silver bullion dealer in Canada. Uh, Martin Katusa, who has built three or four billion dollar companies and sold them. Um, who's the other guy? Rick Rule, who's the uh, U.S. representative. Um, uh, Doug Casey. You, you've heard the name Doug Casey, I'm sure, in the uh, uh, anarcho capitalist uh, thing. Doug Casey is one of the most well known in the thing. They're all in this stock. Well, They've got a track record as millionaires and billionaires and successful. And if they're getting into it, then, you know, that's the track record I do. Not that they're scammers or anything well, like this. Well, yeah, but, but these are, you know, it'd be like if you want to go to real estate, you're going to go to Robert Kiyosaki. But how are they successful? Maybe they have inside information. Maybe they know. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know. But. Yeah, I mean you're following. You do your due diligence on the people. You don't do your due right, diligence right. on the stock. Right. No, I know. Okay. I know exactly what you're saying because I think you now, brought now that up before. Getting back to the significance of the dollar, and here's where we get into some things. Um, you remember the Arab Spring, 2010. The, another thing that I would say was potentially rigged, but yeah. No, no, th- these weren't potentially rigged. This was these were actual rebellions, but the mainstream media and wow. the politicians lied about what the cause of it was. Okay, the, uh, the I don't even remember what they said the cause of it was. To be honest, oh, they were saying because the of the tyrants, the Middle Eastern yeah, tyrants, yeah, yeah. Like, like Gaddafi and whatever, right, and they right. were just going to overthrow the tyrants, uh, Mubarak and all. No, it had nothing to do with that. Yeah, what ended up happening was this was 2009, 2010. It was the, it was in the middle of the Great Recession. The entire world was in recession. Currencies were devaluing all over the place. Um, but it was also a time of high inflation. Do you remember oil was at $145 a barrel? Corn, wheat, every commodity was at all-time highs in the international market. So if your currency is, is, is for crap and you have to buy dollars to buy wheat and other things – you can't afford because the dollar – this is what happened. At the time of the crash, the dollar went down to 72 on the index. And when the Fed started intervening at low interest rates and uh, QE, the dollar in a very short amount of time shot up to 88. Of course, that's strong when everybody else's currencies are in recession and, and devalued. They can't afford to buy dollars to buy food. And so if you take a look at some of the protests, like especially in Egypt, you would see about four or five people wearing bread hats because the whole thing was they couldn't afford to buy bread. It's hard to believe, though, at the time where that was around the time where they went and basically went around and took out all of these, I guess, so-called dictators or whatever, um, or they had planned to in the Middle East, it's hard to believe that they didn't have anything to do with that when you have no. mil- millions of people in the street. Now, I'm not saying that 
the there weren't actual people that that's what they that's the reason behind it but it it's hard to believe that they didn't help that along uh let's see um especially with the history of the cia and overthrowing governments and things like that and and then the whole thing with wesley clark i I don't know how credible that is but i mean he was right for the most part see this is this is this is something that the that the uh, alt- alternative, you know, you know, we always think that the establishment, and the oligarchy, is all powerful. That every, you know, everything bad comes from them. Everything good comes from them. If nothing happens, it comes from them. No, they are powerful, but they don't control everything. Right. Here's, I mean, here's, I here's from the here's from the Telegraph. Either, but this is from the Telegraph, which is a very um, well-known UK uh, newspaper. How the Fed triggered the Arab Spring uprisings. Okay, in the graphs, it shows that they use the dollar first out of Ben Bernanke in his Jackson Hole speech, which uh, caused prices to rise 40% over an eight-month period. Similar correlations can be observed when the Fed purchases and wider commodity indices. Um, and then commodities, of course, notorious to predict. But QE2 caused food and other commodities to go through the roof and most of the uh, Middle Eastern and emerging market uh, economies could not afford to buy dollars to buy food. And that's really, you know, the Arab Spring started in Yemen with uh, a guy who was a, um, you know, he didn't have a food truck, but he had like a food bicycle. <laughs> and um, he couldn't afford to buy the, uh, there wasn't any, yeah, he couldn't afford to buy any of his supplies, his food to make money selling food on the street to his family. So he set himself on fire. And that's what sparked the entire Arab Spring is because they couldn't afford to buy food. No pun intended or that the fire sparked. Yeah, the... well, yeah. <laughs> pun, pun, not pun intended, but that's where it happened. So when you see these currency devaluations going all across, here's here's something that happened. Yeah, but they, they the might dollar... have been involved in the uh, after the fact uh, installing the new leader. Uh, what new leader? No, the leaders didn't fall until the Arab Spring. No, uh, no, Gaddafi what I'm saying was, is after after, after the after Arabs, Arab no, 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 uh, the new leader in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, guy. Oh, um, now that, M- Mubarak didn't get overthrown because of the Arab Spring. That was, that was intervention, yeah. But uh, the, the things that were going on um, in, the, in the Arab Spring itself set the tone where the CIA then could go in and over. Right, right. That's what I mean. And, and the, but, but I, the Arab Spring itself was not a geopolitical CIA event. The Arab Spring was was because of the Fed. Right. No, I understand. But it, but yeah, that I more thought it was the getting Mubarak out and getting in the uh, Muslim Brotherhood guy who eventually the military just took. I, I don't even know what state Egypt is in at this point. Like, the, is the military still in control there? I, I don't want no, to spend they, they a lot a, of time on this, but yeah, they have a, they have a new leader. Um, but as a matter of fact, there was some news that came out that uh, Morsi was the Muslim Brotherhood guy, and he's in prison right now. Yeah, and he's he they were going to put him to death, but the uh, Egyptian Supreme Court has, has stayed that execution right now. So you know, you haven't heard too much about the Muslim Brotherhood besides the fact that Huma Abedin and and her relatives and that are Muslim Brotherhood. And she had access to all the classified material that Hillary did. So, you know, there you go. Anyway, on a side note. So the dollar. Okay. That, that Arab spring and the, and the inability to afford food occurred when the dollar went from 72 to 88. So is that why, so you're saying now it's at 96. So it's over a hundred. Oh, I thought you said it was at ninety six. No, I said I said it was at ninety six on the night of the election. Oh, okay. So now it's over hundred. So over, it, so is that the past four days? Yeah. So that is that what's causing all the currencies to devalue in the rest of the world? Exactly. Um, I, I you know I spoke with Angel Angel Clark today. I do her show on Wednesdays. The Mexican peso is now at twenty two pesos to the dollar. During the early 1980s Mexican uh, Mexican peso crisis, the peso only got as high as 13 to the dollar, and they had a major crisis. Now it's at 22. 
Oh, that's bad. All time high against the dollar. Yeah. Um, Angel, of course, is living like a like a king and queen. Angel and Dave. You know why? Because they get paid in dollars. So they could, you know, they're the pesos devaluing, but they have dollars which are so strong. Everything is is extraordinarily cheap for them. You know. So the uh, the thing that's a, that's a, the problem with the dollar, and we'll get to a few things here. But the significant thing is, well, maybe I should go to Mexico or the Philippines. Yeah. I, I wonder what their um, I've been there, and their Jesus, everything is uh, really cheap over there, and the, well, that was is, even but, back uh, then. You'd be happy if you can get a sustainable uh, Wi-Fi connection to stay. Now here's the here's the thing. Over the last 20 years, the dollar has crossed over 100 three different times. The 1980s, well, I will say 30 years. The 1980s, 90s, and of course, today. Um, guess what, or yeah, the 90s and 2000s. Guess what happened? A major financial crisis instantly took place somewhere in the world when the dollar went over 100 on the index. In the 80s, it was a Mexican peso crisis. In the 90s, it was the Argentinian currency crisis. And then, of course, late 90s, it was the uh, Asian bond crisis. We now are over 100. We've been over 100 for two, three days. As a matter of fact, we almost crossed 101 today. Well, now it seems like it's just everywhere because everybody was already in trouble prior to that. You hit the nail on the head. If, you're curr- if you've been in a currency war where you've been devaluing your currency by the boatload of, since 2011 – what happens when all of a sudden it's like a big swing? As a matter of fact, this is how big the the dollar swing is. The the uh, Kuroda, who's the um, central banker head for uh, Japan, he threw up his hands and said, "Oh my God, I can't control our bond market anymore." They they have bought every single bond and they're buying every single bond, but they're trying to control the price. What's known as the yield curve. The yield curve is the uh, interaction between the short-term bond and the long-term bond i.e the 10-year or the 30-year they try to keep that uh that yield right around zero the problem is is of course is it's been negative and they're so desperately afraid of inflation that they can't control which will cause the the bonds to spike in yield so well the yen the reason the yen is so important and this is this is this is part of why the great casino we have works because the dollar has been strong and the yen has been devalued what the what the uh, banks have done in wall street is they take dollars and they go buy yen and then they buy the japanese uh bond the jgb and they take those bonds and then they pretty much invest because they're get you know you're you're getting more bang for your buck by buying a devalued currency with your strong currency just like in mexico right, right. She buys pesos but, and she can buy the whole grocery store out with 10 bucks. Don't because um, didn't you say that the majority and, and this is why inflation didn't hit as hard, but the majority of U.S. dollars is outside the country. 14, 14 of our $20 trillion are outside the country. We've exported inflation. Remember I said right. the Arab Spring? We're exporting inflation because so, they are forced to buy dollars who, to buy anything in the commodities. Right, right. But who has – I mean, is it the governments that have that money or do the people have any of that money? Well, the governments, the central banks, and the banks. So basically the, the people, they're screwed. But the governments have some – depending on what country, you know, um, some countries have more than others, obviously. Right. And, but and, and, and obviously it's not just uh, commodities like food. Remember, we have a petrodollar system. Right. You have to buy dollars to buy energy. Right. Buy so, from so all oil. of these countries have reserves. Now, some have more reserves than others. The reason is, is because of the trade deficit. And those would China be in has, good shape. When you say reserves, you're talking about dollars, right? Or are you right. talking about oil? And, and, and think about this, okay? When I say dollar reserves, I'm not talking like $100 bills. Because it would not be prudent with a $670 billion dollar trade deficit to when a ship pulls up into the harbor you come with pallets of dollars and back and forth no they do treasury bond they do short term t bills are the short term bonds uh, t uh, yeah, t bills are short term t bonds are the long term that's how you know the difference between the two when you hear them they're they're the same entity but they're different year things 
um, you're not going to give a treasury, uh, you know, in as a le for in payment of letter of credit for a shipment of goods in. You're not going to pay those with 30 year bonds. You're going to pay them with six month or at the most one year bonds, and you get a little bit of interest for taking that. Um, if the dollar is super strong, this means one. Uh, this means two things. One. We get more bang for our buck. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So how how's this? Well, first, first before we get to that, uh, how it how it's going to affect us? Um, we know how it's going to affect other countries, but how long do you think this is going to last? So it just went. You know, um, you said it went from before. It, it so it's it's been going up um, anyway because you said before the election it's, it was ninety six, right? Right. And now it's one hundred and one or something. So. How long do you expect it to last? Is this a long-term thing? Does it depend upon what happens with uh, the you know the, the president elect and Congress and what they do? Does it? I mean, what? How long do you expect the dollar to be where it is now? Okay, this is not a question you can predict and forecast because there. Any certain things can affect the dollar. As we know, interest rates affect the dollar. When the Fed was at zero interest rates, so they now kept the, the Fed may up. up their interest rates because the dollar is where it's at. Right, but the Fed, the Fed may the... raise the interest rates because they're forced to. And the reason why, as I've always said before, the the Fed is not omnipotent. They can't control everything. At a certain point, if you do something to create a bubble, what happens to the bubble? It pops. The same thing with interest rates. You can keep them down, which they have now for 10 straight years at near zero. But the market itself will force interest rates up. You see this in the LIBOR. The LIBOR interest rate is the, the rate that banks trade amongst each other. Okay, When uh, Deutsche Bank needs some liquidity, they might call JP Morgan. I need $6 billion overnight. And the... The, inter the LIBOR is – they determine the interest rate in the LIBOR. The LIBOR has been going up for the past nine months. It's tripled. It's gone from 0.3% uh, to 0.9%. Now, it may not seem like much, but think of a 300% uh, rate hike going from uh, – we're at 3% to 9% seems like a lot to me if you're talking no, about no, no, interest. No, 0.3, 0.3. Oh, 0.3. Sorry. To 0.9. To yeah, 0.9. Less than, uh, less than one. Right. Well, it depends. I mean, if you're dealing, it depends about the amount of money you're dealing with. I mean, if you're dealing, if you're talking about billions of dollars, it makes a big difference. Yeah, but you know what the LIBOR rate is used in? Determining mortgages, credit card rates, student loan rates, everything. It's a, it's, it determines trillions of dollars throughout the world. Okay, so what happens? Think about this. Okay, the Fed has not raised rates yet, correct? Well, they did that one time, like a quarter of a point, what, last year? Last December, but they haven't raised them since, since yet, right. correct? Right. Well, guess what just happened? The uh, the 30-year mortgage just went up to 4%. The Fed didn't raise rates, but so why did the, the banks? banks? Because the, bonds, the bond yields are going up. After the election, okay, the bond, the the ten year bond was at one point seven five percent yield. Now I think I've explained this before, but I'll go ahead. And when you buy a bond and you have the percentage like one point seven five percent yield, what this means is is that you don't pay say a thousand dollar bond, you don't pay a thousand dollars. You pay nine hundred seventy five dollars or nine nine hundred twenty five dollars. And then when it matures, the you, get the years, you get the thousand dollars. You get the thousand dollars, right? Well. In one day, the 10-year had the highest spike in the history of the bond. It went from 1.75 to 2.25. It Does that lock in? So if you buy a 10-year bond at whatever percentage, that can't change, right? No, not when you buy it at that. No. Once you buy it, it can't change. I mean, it can change the right. next day for somebody else who goes and buys it. But yeah, exactly. once you buy it, it's locked in. And, uh, right. and that's why they have weekly auctions. That's that's normally the central bank is sell them. Uh, the bullion banks or the bond bond, the the primary dealers they're called the like J P Morgan's whatever their primary. Dealer. There's 13 primary dealers. They'll buy these bonds and then they'll sell the bonds on the market, you know, taking their low cut. But that being aside, the 10 year went up to 2.25 yield. When a bond yield goes up. 
that means less people are buying them. If more people buy, then the yield goes down. Okay, because people well, are saturating. It's like and supply in. and demand, right? Exactly. So when you see the bond goes up, all of a sudden nobody's buying ten-year bonds. All of a sudden nobody's buying thirty-year bonds. Right. So they got it. It's it's basically well, like no, the, like the analogy. Here's a an analogy because a sports one like the point spread, right? So basically, all a casino for people that don't don't know, right? All, all a casino because they take a vig, so they charge you on a hundred dollar bet that you pay a hundred and ten to get say a hundred back, right? When you bet the spread, yep. And all they want is even bets on both sides because they make ten dollars off every bet. I mean, they make more if you're betting more money, but let's just say everybody's betting a hundred. So if everybody's betting on one side. They're going to raise the spread or lower the spread to get everybody to bet on the other side. So it, it's not the best analogy, but it is in the sense that if you're if it's not people aren't buying it, they're going to raise it to make it more attractive so more people will buy it. Right. Right. And, and since since our entire economy is based on credit, not on capital, not on actual reserves or your you know your savings or or thing, but on credit, which means new money printed. Um, the the higher the bonds, the higher the cost of money. Now think about this: the federal government uh, has these bonds out there. They've got twenty trillion dollars national debt, all in bonds. These bonds mature at a rate of about five billion dollar or five trillion dollars every two years. If the rate of borrowing cost goes up, for every one percent. That's an extra two hundred and fifty billion dollars each year in our our budget, our national budget that we have to put towards interest on the debt. So, do you think the government wants the the rates to go up? Because think about if it shoots to four percent, that means that we would be spending out of our budget, our federal budget, a trillion dollars a year just on interest for all that twenty trillion dollars. And that's debt. that's crazy. I mean, they're already. What I, mean, I know through most of the Obama years, the yearly – and most people don't realize that the debt and the deficit are two different things. The deficit is for that year's budget. The debt is in total what's old. So the debt is what, like 20-something trillion right now, the national debt? And the deficit, I know they got it down to, I think, $500 million one year – or $500 billion, I'm sorry – um, but it was running at a trillion uh, for a couple years there. Yeah, but, um, but, in all, but in all honesty, think about this. Obama's been in office for eight years. The national debt's gone up $10, $10 trillion. Right. Really, do you think the deficit is 500 some odd million? Probably no. not. I mean, that's it, what they say. We reduced the deficit. Counting. Yeah, there, there's stuff that's spent. Behind yeah, yeah. The I mean, it, the it's account. it's how they're accounting. You're right it, too. It, it, I mean, there's accounting tricks and there's ways to, you know, like I heard during the Bush administration, like certain expenses of the Iraq War weren't put in the budget. You know, like right. so there's certain things that, you know, aren't included in the budget. So it looks like, oh yeah, we're we're you know lowering the deficit, but they try to confuse people when they say. Oh, we have a surplus like they did with Clinton, making it like the United States wasn't in debt. No, the United States was in debt. They might have had a surplus for the year. Maybe now, like we just said, you know, they have accounting tricks. But let's just say for the sake of argument, they did have a surplus. They didn't have a surplus like there was no debt. But some people don't understand the difference. They try to confuse people right. and make them think like, oh, yeah, the United States has extra money. Um, what I want to do, and I'm good. It's not because of my stomach. My stomach's feeling better. So um, I'm I'm glad about that. But you since your uh, world and the acid's, acid's running. <laughs> right. uh, I got my, my water that I've been drinking and my, my stomach is fine. So. But I want to take a break because we've been talking for like an hour. But what I want to do when we come back, I, I want to talk more about how this is going to affect us, um, the positives, uh, as far as, you know, more, I would assume, uh, more uh, buying power or what do you call it? More um, purchasing power. Purchasing power. That's the word I was looking for. And how this all came about 
and how an election, because I'm sure it's not just this election. Now, maybe this election affected it more than others, but I'm sure after every election, there's changes maybe for the wor- better or worse. Um, so when we come back, we can talk a little about that and, and kind of get into uh, also some of Trump's picks and how the ones that deal internationally, which basically is, I think everybody in some way, not everybody, you know, maybe not health and human services or something, but um, the majority of the advisors and cabinet, you know, have uh, stuff to do with either the economy or, you know, other countries, which falls under uh, geopolitics and those relationships. So if we have time, we'll get into that as well. So we'll be right back with Ken Shorjan of The Daily Economist. That's the dailyeconomist.com and Ken Shorjan on YouTube. So we will be right back after this. Uh, check us out at nonpartisan liberty for all dot com. Everything's set for tonight, Mr. Trump. I wonder what Trump's game is this time. Trump's got a new game. Hey, Trump's got a new deal. What's your game, Donald? Heard about Trump's new deal? What? What? Trump has a new game. What is it? Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump. Is it an airline? A new convention. Yeah, Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump, what's your game? Mr. Trump, please. My new game is Trump, the game. Trump, the game where you deal for everything you've ever wanted to own. Because it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you win. Yes! Play Trump, the game from Milton Bradley. I think you'll like it. When should you shoot a cop? That question, even without an answer, makes most law-abiding taxpayers go into knee-jerk conniptions. The indoctrinated masses all race to see who can be first and loudest to proclaim that it is never okay to forcibly resist law enforcement. In doing so, they also inadvertently demonstrate why so much of human history has been plagued by tyranny and oppression. In an ideal world, cops would do nothing except protect people from thieves and attackers, in which case shooting a cop would never be justified. In the real world, however, far more injustice, violence, torture, theft, and outright murder has been committed in the name of law enforcement than has been committed in spite of it. To get a little perspective, try watching a documentary or two about some of the atrocities committed by the regimes of Stalin or Lenin or Chairman Mao, or Hitler, or Pol Pot, or any number of other tyrants in history. Pause the film when the jackboots are just about to herd innocent people into the cattle cars, or just about to gun them down as they stand on the edge of a ditch, and then ask yourself the question, when should you shoot a cop? Keep in mind the evils of those regimes were committed in the name of law. And as much as the statement may make people cringe, the history of the human race would have been a lot less gruesome if there had been a lot more cop killers around to deal with the state mercenaries of those regimes. Now, people don't mind when you point out the tyranny that has happened in other countries, but most have a hard time viewing their own country, their own government, and their own law enforcers in any sort of objective way. Having been trained to feel a blind loyalty to the ruling class of the particular piece of dirt they live on, also known as patriotism, and having been trained to believe that obedience is a virtue, the idea of forcibly resisting law enforcement is simply unthinkable to many. Literally, they can't even think about it. And humanity has suffered horribly because of it. It is a testament to the effectiveness of of authoritarian indoctrination that literally billions of people throughout history have begged and screamed and cried in the face of authoritarian injustice and oppression, but only a tiny fraction have ever actually lifted a finger to try to stop it. 
Even when people can recognize tyranny and oppression, they still usually talk about working within the system, the same system that's responsible for the tyranny and the oppression. People want to believe that the system will, sooner or later, provide justice. The last thing they want to consider is that they should illegally resist, that if they want to achieve justice, they must become criminals and terrorists, which is what anyone who resists legal injustice is automatically labeled. But history shows all too well that those who fight for freedom and justice almost always do so illegally, i.e. without the permission of the ruling class. If politicians think that they have the right to impose any law they want, and cops have the attitude that as long as it's called law they will enforce it, what is there to prevent complete tyranny? Not the consciences of the lawmakers or their hired thugs, obviously, and not any election or petition to the politicians. When tyrants define what counts as law, then by definition, it is up to the lawbreakers to combat tyranny. Pick any example of abuse of power, whether it's the fascist so-called war on drugs, the police thuggery that has become so common, the random stops and searches now routinely carried out in the name of security, such as at airports, border checkpoints that aren't even at the border, sobriety checkpoints, and so on, or any other example. Now ask yourself the uncomfortable question. If it's wrong for cops to do these things, doesn't that imply that the people have a right to resist such actions? And of course, state mercenaries don't take kindly to being resisted even non-violently. If you question their right to detain you, interrogate you, search you, invade your home, and so on, you are very likely to be tasered, physically assaulted, kidnapped, put in a cage, or shot. If a cop decides to treat you like livestock, whether he does it legally or not, you will usually have only two options, submit or kill the cop. You can't resist a cop just a little and get away with it. He will always call in more of his fellow gang members until you are subdued or dead. Basic logic dictates that you either have an obligation to let law enforcers have their way with you, or you have the right to stop them from doing so, which will almost always require killing them. Politely asking fascists to not be fascist has a very poor track record throughout history. Consider the recent Indiana Supreme Court ruling, which declared that if a cop tries to illegally enter your home, it's against the law for you to do anything to stop him. Aside from the patent absurdity of it, since it amounts to giving thugs with badges permission to break the law and makes it a crime for you to defend yourself against a criminal, if he has a badge, consider the logical ramifications of that attitude. There were once some words written on a piece of parchment, those words now known as the Fourth Amendment, that said that you have the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures at the hands of government agents. In Indiana today, what could that possibly mean? The message from the ruling class is quite clear and utterly insane. It amounts to this. We don't have the right to invade your home without probable cause, but if we do, you have no right to stop us and we have the right to arrest you if you try. Why not apply that to the rest of the Bill of Rights while we're at it? You have the right to say what you want, but if we use violence to shut you up, you have to let us. I can personally attest to the fact that that is the attitude of the U.S. so-called Department of Justice. Or maybe you have the right to have guns, but if we try to forcibly and illegally disarm you and you resist, we have the right to kill you. Ask Randy Weaver or the Branch Davidians about that one. You have the right to not testify against yourself, but when we coerce you into confessing and call it a plea agreement, you can't do a thing about it. What good is a right? What does the term right even mean if you have an obligation to allow jackboots to violate your so-called rights? It makes the term absolutely meaningless. To be blunt, if you have the right to do A, it means that if someone tries to stop you from doing A, even if he has a badge and a politician scribble, sometimes called law, on his side, you have the right to use whatever amount of force is necessary to resist that person. 
That's what it means to have an unalienable right. If you have the unalienable right to speak your mind, a la the First Amendment, then if all else fails, you have the right to kill government agents who try to shut you up. If you have the unalienable right to be armed, then if all else fails, you have the right to kill government agents who try to disarm you. If you have the right to not be subjected to unreasonable searches and seizures, then if all else fails, you have the right to kill government agents who try to inflict those upon you. Those who are proud to be law-abiding don't like to hear this and don't like to think about this, but what's the alternative? If you do not have the right to forcibly resist so-called legal injustice, that logically implies that you have an obligation to allow government agents to do absolutely anything they want to you, your home, your family, your neighbors, and so on. Really, there are only two choices. You are a slave, the property of the politicians without any rights at all, or you have the right to violently resist government attempts to oppress you. There can be no other option. Of course, on a practical level, openly resisting the gang called government is usually very hazardous to one's health. But there is a big difference between obeying for the sake of self-preservation, which is often necessary and rational, and feeling a moral obligation to go along with whatever the ruling class wants to do to you, which is pathetic and insane. Most of the incomprehensible atrocities that have occurred throughout history were due in large part to the fact that most people answer never to the question of when should you shoot a cop. The correct answer is, when evil is legal, become a criminal. When oppression is enacted as law, become a lawbreaker. And when those violently victimizing the innocent have badges, become a cop killer. So the next time you hear of a police officer being killed in the line of duty, take a moment to consider the very real possibility that maybe in that case, the law enforcer was the bad guy and the cop killer was the good guy. As it happens, that has been the case more often than not throughout human history. Are you looking for a podcast that talks about life, the universe, and everything? Listen in to the Illumination Hour, Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Listen live at Spreaker.com or NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. We're also on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and iTunes. The Illumination Hour, brought to you by Nonpartisan Liberty for All Media and Radio Network, and your host, Ellen Stallone, because a spark can illuminate the world. Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com. And we are back with our bi, is it bi-weekly, bi-monthly, whatever. Um, Our every other Wednesday guest, (laughs) Ken Shorjan of the dailyeconomist.com and of Ken Shorjan on YouTube. Check out his podcast every Monday and Wednesday and sometimes Friday. That reminded me of like a line from a movie or something. They're like every this and this and sometimes, I don't know. Anyway, or you know what? It re- you know what it is? Why? 
or I before E except after C except when something. It was a, some alphabetic rule. Anyway, uh, check out Ken's podcast at on YouTube, which streams live. Uh, usually, I mean, sometimes it's at different times, but was it usually around like seven thirty or something? When my podcast? Yeah. When you oh, I, it, it's ran it's, it's random. I don't times. Uh, yeah, if, if you think about it, it's probably usually between uh, eight o'clock and ten o'clock Mountain Standard Time, or used to not, be you know, Pacific, but <laughs> yeah, when we got switched over, right? <laughs> but usually, but you think of between seven alert. and ten. Yeah, you, you can you can set it up where if you subscribe, if to, you subscribe, uh, yeah, it'll show up. It'll can, show up that I've got a new podcast. Yeah, up. yeah. Well, I mean, it, it will let you know that you're broadcasting live. Like you can set it up that way too, um, to send you an email or on your YouTube. Like if you have a, a um, you know, iPhone or whatever uh, Android phone, uh, and you have the YouTube app, it can you can set it up where it will tell you when. Um, it's broadcasting live. So if you want to put the notification on there as well, or you can just listen, you know, after whatever it's there. Um, so we were talking about the U S dollar and how a lot of the, these things, uh, in the financial markets are related to the recent election. Also, um, before we went to break, I had brought up, so how is this going to affect us, at least for the immediate future? And yeah, this is, just, this is not just the dollar. This is uh, any currency, but we use the dollar as an example. Okay, When you have your currency, whatever country, we use the dollar as an example, when your dollar gets stronger, that means that you have more purchasing power. So purchasing does, does that power that, for things like groceries. Right. Gas. Does that mean things will go down that the prices will go down? Not necessarily. So um, how does that because I always think of you have more purchasing power as prices will go down. Because if they don't, how do you have more how would you define more purchasing power, I guess? Okay. You gotta take all this with a grain of salt. Um, thing we import probably seventy to eighty percent of all our goods from China. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay. But yeah, because our currency is strong, the Chinese yuan, the the RMB, is much weaker in relation to the dollar. So their right. goods are cheaper. So when we import things and they go to Walmart, they're going to be much cheaper. So say, say the, the dollar. I, you're breaking up a little there. And the Ken. Chinese yuan was at, okay, say, say the dollar was at 92. And the Chinese yuan is at 6.78. You know, um, when they ship in, say, uh, uh, a skillet, okay, and the skillet goes into Walmart for 12 bucks. If the dollar goes up to 100, when the next order comes in, that skillet will probably be for about $10.25. So prices will go for the most part, I mean, they, they, I guess they don't have to though, but prices should go down. Should because go down. Because the cost things, should go down. On so, things you right? import. Okay, you I import. see what you're saying. So if you're importing something, it's costing them less to import that. So, of course, if, it, if, it, if it's costing a company less for something, that should affect the price and the price should go down. In theory, it doesn't mean that they're going to do that. They could keep the price the same way it is if they want to make more money. Right. Um, but now, in theory, it should go down then if they're now, importing now, it. So what I said what I said was for the dollar only. And this, this represents right. the dollar only because the dollar is a global reserve currency. Now, say I'm in Egypt. What about, though, before you get to that, what about things that aren't, even though the majority of things are imported, so it's going to affect almost everything, but what about things that aren't imported? It wouldn't make a difference, or wouldn't it, it be it, cheaper it will, for them? If the, supply, if the supply is up, then it, then it will be cheaper. But let's take in consideration this, okay? 
if the dollar is stronger and you say energy is in relationship to the dollar. Now, the last time the dollar went strong, oil went uh, was up at $150 a barrel. If you're in agriculture, which requires a lot of oil, or if you're an airline that requires uh, gasoline you know, or jet fuel, right. okay, you're still going to be paying a high price for that, oil, that energy. It's going to be reflected in the tickets. It's going to be reflected right. your, in the food. Your price isn't going to go down. If the dollar goes up and commodities go down in price, okay, then that's a true strengthening of the dollar. And as commodities go down, that means it's cheaper for the farmer to buy fertilizer, to buy seeds, to buy energy, to right. run his tractors and that. And the food prices are going to be, be down while the dollar is up. So the, the, the best case scenario, and this is, this is why I'm going to transition this into gold. The best case scenario is when the dollar is going up and a commodity that you need is going down. So are the commodities going, like, is the price of oil? Because I noticed... Copper's gone gone down. Uh, Oil went to to 46. I was going to say gold, uh, not gold, oil, but not per barrel, just the price at the pump, like, has been all over the place. But it's been up and down um, recently. So... that that's a, that's sort of a misnomer because yeah because they buy it with like con- they they get contracts like sometimes right like a year in advance or something like that so it might not yeah, yes yes and no we are entering into the winter season the refineries are shutting down most of their distribution so less to supply do a new, no, yeah less supply to do a new grade of the winter blend that uh, has less carbon emissions during the colder weather that's not going to leave the smog. So right now, do they do that even everywhere, though, even in places where it doesn't get cold? So like, like places like state. Arizona, uh, Southern Nevada, Florida, Southern California, do they bother doing that? Oh, it depends. Uh, there's different different rules. Uh, California is anal. You know, they they yeah, switch yeah, twice yeah. a year and, sure. and, and all. Yeah. So, but Arizona is much cheaper than California because of the fact. That we've got, we don't have to require um, a different grades of gas each year. Nevada probably, I would say, if I had to guess, I would say they probably don't because they're not that strict. But I, they may, I don't know. No, but the thing about Nevada is Nevada is more than Arizona because the refineries. Well, the are, rest of the paid. state gets cold though. But the same with Arizona, like Flagstaff area, it snows up there. Yeah, and and the farther away you are from a refinery, the longer that it, the trucks have to go, they're going to do a higher price. Right, because they got to fill up with gas to get there, so that's going to cost them money as well. Exactly. So. so so that's why you take a lot of things a grain of salt. But if you noticed. I don't know if you went and bought some uh, uh, some steaks or whatever at uh, your grocery store. We just got done with three straight weeks of ribeye, T-bone, uh, um, and uh, New York strip. We're all four ninety nine pound. No, but you know what when I was did. Last time I saw four ninety nine pound. You know what I did get, and um, I don't know. It just just went to people that are signed up for their uh, emails, but I just bought a couple of shirts that were 50% off from Perry Ellis, um, which are obviously made in some other country because <laughs> most, uh, when it comes to clothes, probably 90% of them are made in other countries at least, if not more. Exactly. Uh, you know, barely any clothes are made here. So, um, you know, things like that. Now, when like, it comes to gold. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is why it's significant for gold. Okay, people who own gold and that are like, "Oh my God, the price is going down." Ah. Well, you know what? The thing about it is, well, people okay. that that are worried about it that have it they're, are stupid because it's always going to come back, and that's just dumb. It's good for I. I think the price of gold going down is a good thing for everybody because even the people that own gold, they can go and buy more. And eventually there, it's going to go up. It's just uh, remember, remember, there's two scenarios I was telling you about. If you have the dollar getting stronger and commodities going down, that, that's where you have more purchasing power. Your dollar right. can buy more. So when the dollar is going up strong like this and gold is going down, you can buy more gold or gold, right? You can buy or silver. You can buy more copper. You can buy more, which uh, is a positive, oil, you can buy more whatever. 
thing. A although, positive different thing. like you're saying, like people that have a bunch of gold initially, if they're not, you know, it depending on their knowledge, I guess, might start to panic. But I mean, gold is a lot to me. Gold is a long term. Like gold is something you keep for when you retire or something. I, well, I, I, know, I know you keep it to hedge your bets against the other things that you're doing and to keep the value of the dollar. But if you're saving money, the reason why I say long term is because if you save cash, you're going to lose money. Right. In the, in the long run. So you've got to see it, it's all it's all the dichotomy. As I said, the best scenario is when the dollar strengthening and gold's going down, you can right. buy more. You can get more bang for your buck. The problem comes is when the dollar goes up and, and gold is or gold is going up. OK, if gold and is what, going, would, see, what would cause or cause that, first of all, like what would cause the commodities to go up when the dollar's going up? Uh, what? Is abnormal, there a main abnormal, thing or abnormalities in the market? Because right now the dollar is strengthening, not because it's strengthening, because it's the least ugly, you know, ugly girl to dance. Right. The Everybody else's currency, currency is so currency. bad that, yeah. Cause we talked about that before, like how really it's just that the everybody else is, is so bad um, that compared to, you know, everybody else's currency you, you want the dollar, but really it's still shit. Right. Now here's, here's the other scenario. Okay. Remember how I said the, uh, the dollar for imports is more purchasing power for you. Now, if right, the dollar cause... is strong compared to other countries, that means that if they import from you, it costs more. So they're, so gonna they're cut not their, going to right. buy your goods because it costs too much when they can get them from somewhere else. So that's so, the negative so to the whole uh, economy thing. Yes. So there's always a, ne I mean, no matter how you're looking at it, there's going to be a negative to the economy unless everybody's, uh, I guess, dollars are, are doing well. Um, but even in that scenario, I'm sure there's negatives. And when And when did we not have a currency crisis when the dollar was over 100? A uh, da da! When we were on the gold standard from 1946 to 1971, because the dollar wasn't the standard, gold, gold was, was the standard, right. and it kept inflation, it kept purchasing power, it kept all of these things protected. And you know what? It didn't matter who was devaluing their currency around the world. They had to buy dollars, but they had to do it in relationship to gold. Well, you, we had okay. talked about before that there should be really how it should be is – Instead of like we talked about the dollar index, and I don't know how this would work exactly with gold, but at least with an exchange rate, that everything should should be based on gold instead of the other way around. Oh, it should have been. That, the only reason we went off of it is because. Well, but I mean, even when you look at like, and I don't know if the, if it was like it like this back then, but like gold is, you know, like when you look at the dollar and the exchange rate or how much gold cost, it should be the reverse. Like gold is worth this. And then the dollar compared to gold is, I'm not really explaining it right, but you know what I mean? That the op, it should be in reverse that everything should be well, compared yeah. to gold, not compared to the dollar. See here, here, including the, the dollar problem. should okay. be compared to gold. Everything should be based off here. of gold. You are absolutely right. Here's the problem that they screwed up in the first place, okay? Whenever in the past that you had a gold standard where gold was the standard and, and you, the amount of currency that you could print had to be in relation to the amount of gold that you held, they fixed right. the price, okay? If you fix a price and you're not getting it any new supply, all of a sudden you have – here's the amount of, of dollar bills you can print and that's it. Well, the problem is, is that economies grow. You're gonna run and out. If you don't money. have, if you don't aren't able to expand the money supply to deal with the growth, you're screwed. Okay, so instead of fixing a price on gold and just fixing it, what they need to do is allow gold, in relationship to your currency, to float. So instead of up until 1940, 1971, where gold was at $42.64 an ounce or whatever it was. Yeah, and they keep okay. it fixed that, that way. Now you need to do it so gold is about 
ten to fifteen thousand dollars an ounce because then it will cover all the dollars of, in debt that they printed okay and then they can go ahead and work from there and if you want to expand the money supply then you have to your, well, like your currency in relation to gold right. is now instead of fifteen thousand, it's a sixteen thousand five hundred. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be kind of like inflation? Like over the years, gold would go up, and as gold goes up, uh, you have some kind of system uh, as far as you know, similar to the dollar or whatever. Like you know how they can take you know dollars in nineteen forty and compare them to dollars now, and right. like you know, same type of thing. So if you had gold go up, then as gold goes up, then you can print more money. Well, exactly. Now, now here's the interesting thing about gold and silver. Um, back in the 1950s, gasoline was a dime. Uh, let's, I'm going to check something. Um, okay, 19, uh, yeah, 1950s. Gold or uh, uh, was a, was a dime. Right now, the 1950s. Uh, at, in the 1950s, gasoline gasoline. You mean was gasoline? A, was a dime yeah, you said gold per gallon. Okay. Right now, uh, a silver dime, which was what dimes were made of back then, silver, the silver amount. It's like 25 bucks or something, right? No, 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 not a dime. Uh, a dime would no be a quarter, worth, like a. Uh, I was thinking. Yeah, a quarter. Um, actually, I got that wrong. Uh, let me see what a quarter would be worth. Sorry, I'm doing my fancy Google crap. Uh, okay. Um, a quarter... Uh, gasoline was about a quarter in 1950s. I had the dime wrong. It was quarter in 1950s. If you had a 1964 or below quarter, which was 90% silver, right? that today, the silver value is worth $3.06. Like I thought it was like 20 bucks. Not an ounce. Oh, I'm there's not an ounce quarter. in there. No, 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 not not a quarter. It's ninety percent. Uh, the reason it's ninety percent is because um, you want to mix other alloys, so it's durable. Right, right. You know, well, they do the same with you know, up. like fourteen carat gold or ten exactly. carat gold. Like rings are usually ten carat because if you go higher, you may you can bend it, and you don't want it. You know, you yeah, want your ring to be sturdy. Soft. So, yeah, actually, yeah. If you have twenty four karat gold, gold you, yeah, finger, you can bend it. You can bend it. Yeah, and th and that's why that's why they you know in the old movies they used to bite on the gold because if it if it uh, was soft enough, you know if it was real gold then it would dent. Now s the silver value in a nineteen sixty four quarter right now is about three dollars and six cents. Oh, this, so there wasn't about, that much silver in there at in, all. No, there was what like a, a fourth. Uh, because you say right now an ounce of silver is like seventeen something, so if it was three dollars, um, it was less than six, a fourth. Six, you know, like less a than a sixth, sixth or something. Yeah, uh, a fifth, a fifth and something of, of an ounce of, of thing. Okay, but three dollars and six cents worth of silver value isn't that even better than what a price of gas gallon gas is today? Yeah, see that's fucked up. That see the... you be, because silver has kept up with the, with inflation. In relation to ship to the, uh, to right. the dollar, you know, uh, uh, and and it's kept its purchasing power. So that's what the significance of of the the gold and silver standard is: is it holds purchasing power of the thing. The problem is, is that the um, in the late 1960s, or as we got to 1965 when they stopped the silver things, um, they wanted to really expand the money supply to feed the military industrial complex go to war in vietnam, well, vietnam and, then yeah. of course, and then of course lbj with his great society so we got to expand the money supply to do welfare and france said you know what you're expanding your money supply far beyond what the value of gold is we don't want your dollars anymore we want gold yeah that's what i said france and you said no yep. germany uh no no i was thinking of Germ germany when they wanted their gold i thought you were talking about last year no, no, called. no. I'm, I was talking about back years ago. Okay, yeah. Fran France was the one who... Right, triggered. right. France was the one who had br brought yeah, that up the first time. Out, we kept giving out so much gold that at a certain point, boom. Now, here's the interesting thing. Um, you remember the stagflation of the, of the 70s? Well, because the dollar was not backed by anything from 1971 to 1973, that was the reason behind the um, oil crisis. Yeah, was and that when uh, they had the lines and they, they had... There was one point in the 70s, I don't know if it was later or where 
you uh, could only get gas. It was based on your birthday, like even or odd or something. In even an odd year, you could only get gas birthday every or other your day, or plate yeah, or like sh- sh- like that. Because my parents like told that. me about that, so I don't I don't know if that was the late seventies with Carter no, or no, no, it, was, it was the early seventies. Uh, okay. Nixon. No, the, the oil crisis was uh, about 1973 because we were no longer in a gold standard and the right. Arab, the OPEC nation said, what do we want this paper crap for? And then that forced Kissinger to go over to Saudi Arabia. And, and that's OPEC when they made the they, deal with OPEC and petrodollar. Right. right. So, so the gold standard became the oil. So standard. if that, oh. if that never happened, the dollar, we could the, speculate there, on what would have happened to the dollar would have fell apart. Probably the dollar would have collapsed. Uh, the world would have demanded a new Bretton Woods. To, they would have probably gotten to a gold standard or done a currency reset or something like that. Um, you know, but of course, you didn't have consensus in the world like as much as you do today. The Soviet Union wouldn't have done anything to help the U.S. Did, China, China under Mao, yeah, wouldn't have done then. anything to, to the U.S. No. But, but, uh, Europe, but France wouldn't have done anything to the U.S. and Europe was already in turmoil. So at the time, did. Nixon issue that as an executive order or did he yep. have did he go through Congress? Nope, executive order. See, that's fucked up because that's something to me and I know there's only been one executive order that's ever been challenged. And there was an article and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. I'll just mention this real quick that Glenn, Glenn Greenwald wrote that Obama opened up this whole thing because His executive orders, it wasn't the amount because people would say, oh, well, this president did this many and they're just picking on Obama because it's Obama. It wasn't the amount. It was the type of ones that he did because the executive orders are supposed to be administrative. They're supposed to be based on existing laws and to administrate the laws. That's really, I mean, really they're unconstitutional as far as I'm concerned. An executive order should be something like uh, when Hurricane Katrina went to, you know, occurred, he declares an executive order for special appropriations to go do that. See, that would be something that would be feasible because how long would it take Congress to go through their committees and that to get money to um, to, to New Orleans? Okay, but... But, but the, it was the mainly build, the adm- the administ- of- administrative uh, stuff as well. It's like a law that's already been passed that oh, yeah, his, is being, his, you his know... Law say, his law saying that, uh, you, that coal no longer is valid, that, you know... Right, and like he it, he's it, issuing it, oh. laws basically um, via executive orders. But what that does is that gives that power. Once you open that door, you give that power to the rest of the presidents that are going to follow. Let, let me let me give you a scenario. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go into some conspiracy theory. Even though it's conspiracy fact, if you ask most people, because they have cognitive dissonance, they they can't do this. Okay, why did Congress never really challenge very much? As a matter of fact, uh, the only thing that Congress challenged was the immigration law, where he just gave amnesty. Well, because they w- they knew when a Republican president came in, they wanted that power for them. That that's in part, but there's an even bigger thing. If you if you search through the archives, the United States officially went bankrupt in 1936. Yeah, and so, right, and supposedly and, that uh, the United States is still in bankruptcy, and the Department of Treasury is managing the bankruptcy or something like oh, that. Oh no, 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 no! There's a, there's a different entity that that uh, that took care of the bankruptcy. It was the Vatican. Oh, right, right. I okay, the Vatican that. did that. That's why if you go out to Dun and Bradstreet and you look up the corporation, the United States of America, the um, the executor, the one who who pretty much is the CEO of the corporation, is an archbishop <laughs> from the Roman the Catholic Church. Crazy, Dun and Bradstreet. That's our corporation. You know, so anyway, um, the, what was done in 1936 was there was a uh, declaration of emergency that was declared. Guess what? 
I looked through the archives. I looked through anything I could find. That state of emergency, that declaration of emergency has never been rescinded. Right, I've heard that as well. And that this it, allows the president to, to have do whatever they want. Thing. Now, the reason we still have the facade of Congress and the facade of all these things is because if the president was ruling, somebody would start asking questions that they don't want to do. So Congress does the day-to-day -day and some of the other stuff, but when it comes down to some serious stuff— um, that's the, the president can pretty much supersede and override things. That's why this is, this has been always a touchy subject. How I, I don't believe that's why they do it. I believe they do it because it's just like the, a lot of the sovereign citizen stuff that a lot of it may be true, but the judges are going to be like, no, we're not going to do this. Um, I believe they do it because they believe that they can really do whatever they want. And well, they, they pretty much do whatever they want. But they want to keep like, an like illusion said, of freedom. Like you, said, you, you and I are in disagreement because you're one of the, the you're one of the, uh, the the crowd of people who believe that the the government and the cabal are all autonomous and they can do No, anything. I, I don't believe they're all them. autonomous. I, I believe that the government in general um, and there's tons of example of uh, examples, especially the courts. Um, that they get away with whatever they want for the most part. And there was there was a president who just said something do. famously. Um, oh yeah, there was. A, I forget who the who the president was, but uh, one time the the court was going to do something, and the president said, "Well, the court can rule anything it wants. Now let's see it enforce it." That's the thing about it is to to me the biggest mistake that uh, that the early founding fathers made besides not getting rid of slavery at the beginning we might, wouldn't have had a civil war um the biggest mistake that they made was not putting the the uh um justice department under the judicial branch versus the executive branch because the judicial department should be in charge of you know it's like the tv show law and order that should be all under one roof it should not have the governor of the state or the mayor of the city being in charge because if the if they're corrupt then they can ensure that nobody ever investigates them no if the judicial department controls all of law enforcement and law and order then they can make sure and keep um greedy and and corrupt people from using law enforcement for their own benefits right that i don't think that would work neither because they to me they're all government they, they're not well, all autonomous they fight and whatever and but it's still they at least in a public uh from a public standpoint that they they pretty much are autonomous to the public now of course they, they don't agree the, the on best, everything or whatever example, but right. The best example right now, of course, is uh, Loretta Lynch or Eric Holder. Okay, Eric Holder decided on his own. I'm not going to. I'm not going to um, uh, investigate the banks. Right, but but I don't jail. think he did that because he said, "Well, technically, we because going back to 1936, we're in a state of emergency, and I can do this." No, no, no. Is no, what no, I'm but, saying. No, that's is that the they they don't the conscious yeah but but I'm saying even the president they don't consciously say well I can do this because of what happened in 1936 they just do it because they feel that they can get away with it well yeah and, but, but you know no, what I mean I don't and, think and they and consciously the think about it I'm not worried about the president the president's always going to each branch of government's always going to try to push and see how far they can go yeah my like the judges is, I don't think they say well we're under maritime law no, or whatever that thing question, is my question has to be and, why did Congress not – I mean, Republicans have had control of the House and the Senate since 2012 election, 2012 and 2014. They took them well, back. Well, very – Why it, didn't they step very up close. To, why didn't they step up to Obama and started forcing – why didn't they impeach him? Why didn't they do any of these things? One, because they're all now – most of them are part of the same establishment. Yeah, of course. They, they're not okay. going to they, – they're on the same – they're professional wrestlers. I mean, now, it, that's – but now it's a good transition to see why Donald Trump is doing a ploy, why there's a big fear by the establishment that Donald Trump you know, is going whatever. And we'll talk about some of his, his picks. You know, Obviously, Donald Trump was not wanted by any of the Republicans during the primaries. Okay, He somehow snuck through. 
At least that's uh, what they the said. Republican, the Republican Party went out of its way. McCain, McConnell, Paul Ryan, uh, Rance Priebus originally. They, you know how much money the, the RNC actually provided to Trump? I mean, we're talking pittance. The Democratic, the DNC gave uh, billions to the Hillary campaign to you know, get her a thing. Donald Trump, for the very most part, had to use his own money and get small donations from from the people. The banks didn't want him. Wall Street didn't want him. Nobody wanted him. Why? Because he was going to upset the apple cart of the status quo. Now, here's the thing. Here's the question. So Everybody, they say. And it, I, I know, I know, you, you don't believe in this. I, no. but, and but, I think we'll find that out very quickly. Uh, you know, in the months and years to come. You got to look um, at the Brexit but, vote. You know. The the, the Remain vote was 7%. All the betting houses in Britain said the Remain's going to happen. They got a seven-point lead, and they lost, okay? And the whole world shook. The same thing is going on here. Um, Donald Trump won. The whole world is shaking. I mean, you would not believe what's going on across the world. And as a matter of fact, the frequency shift is so great. It's it's so similar to what happened 100 years ago leading up to World War One. Let me tell you what happened on Saturday. Saturday, the European Commission called this emergency meeting along with Germany. They wanted an emergency meeting. How are we going to deal with Donald Trump? You know, what are we going to do? Guess who chose not to send any delegates and decide not to show up? France and Britain. Two of the largest European countries said, oh, we're not going to mess with this. We're not going to go. The European Commission is suddenly cracking. The European Union is cracking. Okay. Okay. There is a vote coming up, a referendum in Italy, at the end of November, early December. And if the vote goes a yes, then uh, we're going to see uh, their Prime Minister Matteo Renzi get some some superpowers to try to deal with the financial crisis that they've got. Um, Italy has always been, think of it as one big mafia. And the parliament is like the ultimate mafia. They don't really... They want reform. They just want to keep scamming the people and, and collecting their cash, even if the whole country goes to flames. So uh, this referendum is to the people to give Renzi a thing. If Renzi fails, he said he's already going to quit. He's going to resign. And right now, the political parties in the pre-election vote are extreme right wing. They're anti-euro and they're anti-EU. What we could see in Italy, if this referendum fails, is that the, the complete changeover of the government and the political parties come in are going to take them out of the eurozone now we have two countries that are out of the eurozone once you start seeing two three four countries the eurozone is done european union's done you're back to nationalism you know make america great well make italy great make britain well, I don't great i believe in France nationalism great. but i don't believe in globalism neither right so uh this is exactly what happened at uh, world war one you know world war one at the very end of it saw the the creation of Oh, about two dozen new countries. Uh, U Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Poland became a, a nationalized thing. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was gone. The Ottoman Empire was gone. The uh, Prussian Empire. You know, it was called Germany, but it was really right. the Prussian Prussia. Empire from Frederick the That's Great. That's where the school, uh, the, um, yeah, our school system country. came from. Right. So, I mean... As far as what's going to happen with foreign policy in other countries, that's a whole nother thing. Now, the right. one, the one here, thing here, here. I, I, I do know that I'm just going to say real quick because I'm going to talk about it tomorrow is that okay. I don't see happening is I still see the it going in the same direction where we have less freedom and more and more freedoms are going to be taken away. It doesn't matter who the fucking president is. That's what's going to happen. I, I would just it, say this. It, if you're, you're going to mention the word freedom. Don't generalize it like that because the, the term freedom is – you need to quantify more it. More police are going to be uh, – have more powers in harassing people. There's going to be more spying. There's going to be uh, but, more but cameras, be, more surveillance. Okay, more but, There's going to Trump be – Trump has already said that he's going to put in and he showed a list – of only judges who are constitutional. He said it's going to be protection of freedom of speech, protection of gun rights, protection of this. He, so if so you were the constitutionalist. But, but you also had said that he said a lot of shit that he didn't mean. Ah, right? now, now, so, now uh, I'm going to throw that back at you in this, in this thing. 
Trump has not done one single thing. And constitutionalists, yet. as far as I'm concerned, don't protect your your freedoms. You know, going after people that possess drugs, I think, is a violate is a violation of people's rights because it's a violation of self ownership. So, yeah, I mean, well, show me a country in the world that has self ownership without uh, responsibility. What do you mean by without responsibility? There has to be some some value of authority that people follow. Otherwise, you would have 300 million people all with their own values. Some of those people would be Satanists who think it's right to sacrifice people because that's their self-determination. No, you know, that's... If you don't, that's, have, that's, if you don't have an authority <laughs> and a moral code of some That's violating forth, the freedom of other people. When it opinion, comes to... In your opinion, no, it's not my not opinion. By a it's, standard. It's, Show me the standard. It's... Natural law, when you go and kill somebody... Natural or, law or, is survival of the fittest. Or Lions you go and, about- and steal their property, or you go and assault them. But see, but see, just, natural law. Lions don't ask the gazelle, am I hurting your feelings before tearing into them for meat? Wolves don't don't move from one place to another. I don't know what that has to do with self-ownership and being able to put what you want in your body. I, I don't well, understand the correlation. Well, putting yourself in the body, well, you can do that, you know, and pay the consequences of it, but you can yeah, still do it. Yeah, the government owns you. We've allowed they the They don't that own way. you, but they uh, act as if they own you. Well, yeah, but the thing about it is, is, Nobody stands up to the government and tells them to stop. We 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 write columns, which I do. Uh, we do brought podcasts like you do. Uh, but guess what? I don't see freedom lovers out in the street right now. I see a bunch of well, being out in the street is stupid. Why would I be out in the fucking street? Throw the system. Why would I be out in the street? That's the, it's the least safest place for me now. If they want to come to my house. <laughs> You know, then that that's a different fucking story. Why? Right. I mean, being out in the street is stupid. My point. My point is, is that if we sit behind and just rant on the radio, the government's just going to keep doing what they're doing. It doesn't change a thing. Um, well, we, but, the, but the but the point it may is, change, it, not not totally. If if you can change people's minds to because basically, uh, the people obviously outnumber the government. So if you can get a certain amount of people to not comply with certain laws that are ridiculous. And we can still say, stay in your framework of government, but say that, okay, these laws violate people's rights, whatever laws they are. You, you, are, you are dead on. You and are dead on. If now, you can me- get enough people, but hold on, but you, and we can get enough people, and it doesn't even have to be uh, a majority of the population, you know, depending where you are, maybe 20%, whatever. And you could say, hey, we're not going to do this. And at the same time, I put self-defense in there as well because I think this is what I think is kind of ridiculous. And Larkin Rose made the same point, and I I, I totally agree with him because I've said it before too. Civil disobedience and noncompliance are different, and this is how I define them. I define civil disobedience as you're going to break the law to get attention, and it it's worth it if you get a lot of attention and people see, oh, my God, look what police are doing. They're arresting people for something so stupid, right? If it gets attention, maybe it's worth it. But what they do is they defy the government and that they break the law, but then they say, okay, arrest me. I'm saying noncompliance to me is things that they're violating your rights because – just because the government makes a law doesn't mean that it doesn't violate your rights. And you say not only that you're not complying, but if they try to physically uh, grab you, that you will defend yourself. Because okay. what's the hey. point of just protesting and and s- civil disobedience and saying, hey, I'm not going to obey you until you come to arrest me, then I'll obey you. Okay. No, you're right. Now, have we had any examples of civil disobedience? Individ- There's a lot. No, hold on, but hold not on. the we, uh, no, yeah, right. But do we have any examples of non-compliance in the last month? There is one. I'm just wondering if you know about it. I may, but up up in Oregon, 
the federal federal That's not uh, the last month that was like a couple months ago okay uh there was the clive and bundy trial. right right but that that was right and what the, ended the, up the happening. trial was recently but the what happened in the right uh, i'm talking about the trial yeah they got off yeah you know why somebody got murdered as well by the police in the process right but th- that aside there were 50 charges the the individuals the citizens who were on the jury saw the laws and they claimed nullification which is very rare exactly we finally had something this is and see this is the point i'm trying to make do you remember the movie v for vendetta but in that yes but in that process okay okay, even if you're found not guilty you still lose even when you win you lose because once you get arrested you lose well guess what and i'll tell you why and life on earth is not fair there's not you know what it's always going to be the ones who have the power rule no, but even if you get off, you still lose because you spend time in – and I, I don't know if you've ever been arrested and been in court. I have. Uh, yeah. I've been through a trial. I've been through appeals for bullshit, for a fucking obstruction of an officer when all I did was ask him why he was asking me to get out of my car on private property. And for that, I had bruises all over me, got thrown on the ground, knee in the back, all this fucking shit – and a judge looks at the pictures and says, well, you're still guilty. So, Did you have a jury trial? You can't have a jury trial because it was such a minor misdemeanor. You can always demand nope, a jury trial. You cannot. The Supreme Court has okay, ruled. You, you, if the, if the, listen for a second. Okay. If the punished maximum penalty is six months in jail and a $1,000 fine, you are not entitled to a jury trial based on now this is bullshit because obviously it says it both in the nevada constitution and the supreme uh the supreme court the uh constitution but the supreme court has ruled on this because people appealed it and they agreed so i couldn't get a jury trial so think about that that jury nullification wouldn't even apply because i couldn't get a jury they would not give me a jury I had to have a bench trial. And on top of that, it should have been thrown out just on the basis that they used, um, you know, years ago when most of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time cases would get thrown out for excessive force alone, you know, improper arrest procedures, whatever, um, that doesn't happen. Maybe it never happened, and I just, you know, heard about it happening a couple times and thought it happened more often. But, you know, that doesn't happen. Now, luckily, I got arrested for it again because they just didn't like my demeanor. And the DA sent me a letter three days later and said, we're not filing charges because this was ridiculous. Right. But I, I, I've dealt with – I'm not going to go into it on on air but i've dealt with courts and no that's fine that's fine enough and you know what? enough times to yeah, and, and, to and, know and, the and courts to be honest, and to be honest and, it's, it's like uh the guy over at uh uh oh i forget uh, the freedom project or whatever uh who did a civil obedience disobedience or, or adam kokesh you know what yeah uh, throwing open a gun right there in washington dc wanting to get busted you know once you get on that list you're screwed um, it, it, your, your name yeah. be ever. You, you know that they have now you know you know how they have um registered uh sex offenders they right. now have registered gun offenders <laughs> i'm not no i'm not kidding you can oh, go I, I, i'm sure you I'm can sure. Yeah. adam kokesh is one of them you can go in chicago and washington dc you can go on a website put in an address and see the registered gun offenders in the area that's why something like that that it, it's it's like freedom of speech. It's like you have to let people say things that you don't agree with because if you don't, eventually what you want to say is going to get taken away. It's the same right. thing with but registered those, sex but, offenders. But I know you, they're bad, but look what it opened up. You're right, but look at this. What you were talking about in Chicago? That's that's a state thing. Nevada state thing. I know. It, I know you're right about right, the, right. the jury trial. No, no, you're right. It's a but state here's the thing. thing. Here's the, here's the, the point I was making. But okay? I, I'm not talking if about people... just. Wait, wait. I'm just not. I'm not talking about just Nevada. 
I've been in other states, okay, well, it, no, it, I'm, in I'm, courts. I'm back up in the states. But, but here's but, my point. Here's my point. If people really wanted change, why did they vote in Mayor Daley for 30 years? Why did they vote in Rahm Emanuel? Why I didn't do they live in those in places. Trump? But Okay, but my point is, why do you vote in Harry Reid every year or every, every six years? The point is, is that people can rigged. change. The people can change, but they choose not no, to. No, it, because it's fucking rigged. It's not rigged vote wise. It's, it's only rigged. It's only rigged on a close election. No, it's rigged in the sense that you don't pick your candidates. They're presented to you. So right away, you got idiot number one or idiot number two or evil number one or number two. I don't believe in, I don't believe in the system period. And I could sit there and, and explain in, in so much detail why, um, obviously we don't have the time to do that right now, but I mean, it, it's rigged in the sense that you have two political parties that run everything along with money. Now, let me give you an example real quick. Um, and I and I know it's it's uh, over. We've gone over time. I'm I'm good. It, it, it's up to you if if you want me to give your to example, wrap it up. and I'll give my I'll give my example. Okay. And we'll call well, it let, let me let me give you uh, yep. two examples real quick. One that I, I meant to to uh, bring up earlier was the if you get arrested, you lose because unless you're getting money from a civil trial. You spend time in jail, you get arrested, you have to get bailed out, you go through that whole process. So even if you're found not guilty, you still were had to go through that whole thing. So that's right. why you lose no matter what, unless you're able to sue and get money. And the amount of people that do is barely any. And so the other thing, I was talking about rigged elections, right? Now I forget what I was, uh, my point there. Was that what I was talking about? Uh, the second thing I was going to say, because now I lost. I don't know the second thing you were going to say. I know, I know that you had two examples. Let me give mine real quick, and then if you and remember, then, we'll right. go ahead and do it. Remember the movie V for Vendetta? Yeah. Okay. Uh, after he had blown up the, the old Bailey building, and he broke, broke into the television you know, and gave his speech, he said, if you see what I see, if you feel what I – hold on a second. The cough button. Uh, if you see what I see, if you feel what I feel, then one year from today, meet with me right. at the Parliament they Building. All showed and you up know there what? And... Well, yeah, because they chose to show up. They made a stand. They wanted change. Okay, right, but you're not going to get it showed through up? the system. What if nobody showed up? But that's yeah, different. But, but you're talking about two different things. I, but you, my, no, but I, your, my example no, was no. The, the system. Let me finish my example. Let me finish okay. my thing. You said earlier. That all you need is a small amount of people. You don't need a vast majority to be willing to do this. I'm saying yes. You're absolutely right. To right. protest, Show not me to vote these, somebody oh, in. Protests don't mean you anything. brought up not to protest, but to take action. You brought up voting. There you go. You, no, but you brought up voting, and then you used an example that had nothing to do with voting. Right, but if people aren't – the thing about it is, is starting out, if people aren't willing to change their own local governments through voting, which is not as rigged as, as say, the senator or the it, president it, or whatever. It's not as, but it is because go look at – and I think I brought this up to you before. Go look at, like, the budget for whatever county Phoenix is in, okay? And, and don't or, tell oh, yeah. me – Look at all the federal money that's coming in and don't tell me that, you know, things aren't rigged. They All I was going to say was um, when it comes to elections, you know, you have your candidates chosen for you. It's pick this person or that person. It's it's the illusion of choice is really what it is. And you don't have a choice now in your example. Yes, you have a choice to go do that, and you can make changes that way. I agree with you, but there's nothing that's going to change through the system. You have to go outside the system to make the change. And what your example, that's what you're doing. So that's why I'm saying you can't say, well, voting, but then use an example of not voting. Well, you can, one, but one that's the, what you did. One of the significant things about V, of course, is that V was a symbol. He was a demagogue. He was... He was powerful enough in his own individuality to get away and do these things. You know, the the whole thing behind V, of course, was the uh, Guy Fawkes 
and the Gunrunner plot to blow up Parliament in 16 whatever. Do we have someone powerful enough and strong enough to do that today to rally people? Well, right now, somebody is paying for the Black Lives Matter, the, yeah, they're, they're uh, the protests against Trump, the whatever. Right. Somebody is funding the money. All, somebody so, has powerful to that's, do it. That's the problem. Who is going to do it? Who's going to do it for the freedom? Right, movement? exactly. And that's one of the problems because if you know, if I had a uh, million dollars or well maybe that wouldn't be enough but oh. if i had 10 million dollars or a billion dollars you know i would do the I, I would go out there and i wouldn't rig it i'd go out there and get the exposure so i could communicate to all these people about what's really going on and show them government for what it really is and do you think do you think that they're not in, gather I, enough I mean think about this to, think about this okay they're saying tear down the electoral college you know why because we're a democracy you can't you can't do we're it. not a it's democracy a, it's, it's in, you'd have to add a constitutional amendment the, the the part of the problem too is that the people because of the education system because of the government right, because of the media that. people for gen, the for the last two three generations are so programmed that they couldn't see freedom or they couldn't see truth. Or right, they and what see is that? That's rigging in a sense. That's programming. That's more than rigging. Right, but that leads to the rigging. You know what I mean? All of those things, and that's what I'm saying. When I say everything is rigged, I don't mean it's rigged like they faked the vote count. I mean it's rigged in that... You know, so many aspects. That's an aspect of it. The brainwashing along with, you know, of course, the money they throw into it. You you even look at elections. And this is why I'll tell you, and we can end it on this, why on even local elections or state elections, you have people, billionaires that are throwing money into states that they don't even live in to help the control the outcome of an election bingo that's what the that's what the democrat and and some of the PAC super PACs are doing to try to change texas to a blue state exactly so i mean things uh, that that, that's what i'm saying things are you know to me i mean not every you can't rig every little single thing but in general the things are controlled Things are rigged, and the only answer is outside the system. Now, the problem is, as you said, getting everybody together. And the other thing is people have different ideas. I have different ideas than than what the ideas that you have, where even with all this stuff and all the shit you know and all the fucking, you know, that the government isn't even, um, you know, the shadow government and all that, that you still want a government knowing that you were going to get the same outcome again. How is it going to be different a second time? It's not. So to me, I believe in an organized society, but I believe in the freedom as long as you are not killing somebody, harming them, whatever, you know, unless it's self-defense, stealing their property, that you own yourself, you're born with that right, and you have the right to do whatever you want as long as you don't interfere with somebody else's freedom. Because once you touch somebody else or kill somebody or, you know, all the things that I said, you're interfering with their ownership of themselves. And government, even if they had a constitution that that's all it said, it still would not last. And the other thing is that they have all the guns and all the men with guns that are ready to do something. And if the people had as many as the government did, and they could actually challenge the government, things would be a lot different. That would be the check and balance on the government. But my fear in that is that it wouldn't last because the government would eventually pull some shit uh, because if they're collecting taxes, of course, that's another thing that gives them their power. You know, we're all paying taxes. We're all being extorted. So um, I know you got to go because you're an hour late over there now, too. Uh, hour late, an hour ahead over there, too. But um, 
Yeah, we didn't change time. The Mountain Standard Time sort of morphed. Yeah, Arizona um, and Hawaii as well is the other state, if you didn't know that. That just means means Monday Night Football starts at 6.30 instead of 5.30. (laughs) I like the Pacific Time when it comes to football, man. Games games start at 9 o'clock. Pacific is great because on college day, you can watch the first game at 9 a.m. Yep. And you can watch the last game till 1 a.m. Yep. And you don't have to stay up till like fucking 4 or 5 in the morning to watch, you know, the Western game. I mean, fucking Nevada, when they played, I think, New Mexico, uh, they had a rain delay and the game went until like, you know, 1 in the morning. But if you're on the East Coast, you know, it went till 4 in the morning. So I don't think anybody's watching uh, that over there. But, um, Thanks again, as always, and uh, definitely check Ken out at his website, thedailyeconomist.com, and check out his podcast at Ken Shorjin on YouTube. And uh, there's a couple out there for this week already, and there's some from last week as well if you want to listen to the one uh, right after the election and uh, – Ken's comments on that and his uh, podcast on Veterans Day as well, which talks uh, a lot about that. So I I know a lot of the um, podcasts out there talk a lot about the election and how it relates to all this stuff, which we kind of got into. But um, being that I'm going to do a show about Trump tomorrow, I didn't want to get too much into uh, the Trump thing. So. So thanks again, as always, Ken. Uh, It's always fun, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Yep, yep. Talk to you soon. All right, man. Take care. Again, that was Ken Shorjan. Ken uh, Shorjan on YouTube and thedailyeconomist.com. And check us out, of course, at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. That's all the time we have for tonight. I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. And just keep on listening and and keep on fighting for freedom, true freedom, not the bullshit freedom that conservatives uh, talk about. Take care, everybody. We don't get to take the court. And at the end of the day, each and every man can go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary, you need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of the police officer. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime.